Thanks, Bill. Uh, thank you for the organizing meeting, particularly Gavin and Amal, for inviting me to share some of our uh, data on MS. Um, so we've been in this game um, of developing sort of immune-based therapy or cell-based therapies for various clinical indications. Particularly, I've been in the field of EBV research for almost 30 years, and probably too long. Um, and <laughs> trying to sort of translate those laboratory sort of research finding into the clinic has been our sort of a, um, a dream, and we've been reasonably successful in taking that research into clinic. Um, we were the first group to take our T-cell therapy programs into transplant patients for post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease in, in, in solid organ transplant patients. And I remember almost seven, eight years ago when Michael Pender uh, came to see me, and, and it's a journey which we have jointly traveled together, and I would like to share that with you, some of the very interesting data. Now we are at a stage where we actually handed over this program to one of our um, pharma collaborators. Uh, to progress this program, which is moving quite rapidly. So these are my disclosures, um, and particularly I want to mention, uh, because uh, as I said, we have an ongoing collaboration with one of the pharma companies, which is Atara Biotherapeutics, and, uh, um, and uh, oops, is it? yeah, um, and they are actually a scientific advisory board of theirs, and also we get research funding from them as well. Um, I think that's an important message, because I'm going to share some of the, uh, the recent clinical trial data as well. So as I said, um, I just before I start, I do want to acknowledge Michael uh, and, and Scott Burroughs, who are two of my colleagues who we've been working together for well, over 30 years and with Michael recently in almost a decade now. I'm, I don't know how many of you know Michael. Michael is a very interesting character. He's, he's been in the field of MS for many, many years, and he's been championing this whole concept of pushing this EBV link um, and, and trying to argue the case that somehow the EBV-infected B cells are actually the main culprit in MS pathogenesis. And, and many, I think, probably poo-pooed the whole idea of his. And, and it seems to sort of, there's a slight turn in the thinking of a lot of people, maybe not everybody in the audience, but slowly there is an increasing recognition that there is some role of EBV in MS. Whether that is the major role or a minor role, I won't argue with that. Everybody has their opinion. But let's see what data I have present to you, and you can make your own decision on that. Um, we heard in the last two days that MS is a very complex disease, and it has many intrinsic and extrinsic risk factors, and I've listed some of those. Of course, there are a lot many, but what I want to focus on is the, the EBV role of EBV in there. And you can see this, the, the risk factors are actually highlighted at the, uh, the, the, the intensity goes up as you increase the number of combinations, like smoking, vitamin D, and uh, we heard about actually DR15 early in the morning. And you can see that actually, Having an EBV infection per se is not a risk. Let me just be very clear. You have to acquire an acute EBV infection. That is, as a, acquiring as a young adolescent, to what you call an acute infectious mononucleosis is the risk. The acquiring an EBV infection asymptomatically early childhood does not increase the risk of getting MS. It's, it's the acute infection of that. And then on top of that, if you have very high levels of antibodies to what we call EBV nuclear antigens, is increases the risk even further. So if you combine those things together with smoking, you have a 240-fold increased risk. And, and again, you know, if you just have these two issues of the EBV as acute infection, and abnormal, it goes up even higher as well as 82-fold. And this is one of the review we just have published, and Gavin is actually as a co-author on that. Uh, please have a, take a photo if you want to take it. This is the, I won't have time to cover 40 years of MS and EBV history, but this review sort of summarizes that, and please have a look at this. Hopefully, I mean, we're given a very balanced view on, <laughs> not a biased view of the EBV and MS. So what is EBV? I don't know. I hope everybody's heard about EBV. And, um, and, and having worked in this, for this, with this virus for almost 30 years, and very recently we celebrated 50 years of its discovery, it's a fascinating virus. You know, um, we have co evolved with this virus for all millions of years. And many of you may not know that even the chimps, macaques, um, and, and even the marmosets, they all have a type of Epstein-Barr virus. They're called lymphocryptoviruses. Um, I have, I, I, it would be very fascinating to see if these chimps and macaques have also developed MS, if they get acute infection with their own lymphocryptoviruses. It's a great model for that to study the pathogenesis of disease. It's a human gamma herpes virus, and at any given time, 80 to 90% of the population carries this infection. And one of the other interesting features of this virus is that once you acquire this infection, either through kissing or through other means, it becomes 
latently infected in your body, and predominantly it infects the B cells, the B lymphocytes in your body. And that virus sits as a latent infection with a limited gene expression. During the acute phase of infection, when we acquire this virus during young adolescence, as the kids go into the colleges or the uni, and they kiss their boyfriend or girlfriend, and that's when the highest rate of infection is acute infection is seen, you develop these very severe symptoms. We have still not been able to precisely understand why a young adolescent acquiring a primary EBV infection reacts so strongly than a young child would react. And so it seems to be that as our immune system matures, becomes more established, at that stage, the acquisition of EBV causes a lot more severe reaction to the viral infection than that a young, immature immune system does. So that's the simplest sort of information. What is other fascinating thing is that the EBV is associated with a large number of diseases, which is very interesting. It has two different types of diseases. One is called B cell origin diseases, and there are some typical atypical diseases which arise in non-B cell lineage cells, which is epithelial cells. These are, many of these are malignancies, um, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, gastric carcinoma, T TNK lymphoma. All these are actually are in epithelial or non-B non cell origin. But the B cell associated diseases are Burkitt, diffuse Hodgkin lymphoma, and PTLD. And of course, infectious mono and multiple stories sit in that category. The other interesting thing is some of these diseases are predominantly origin in immunosuppressed individuals. The other diseases emerge in immunocompetent individuals. To some extent, in our immune system, because it acquires these viruses, particularly EBV or other herpes viruses, very early in their life, in my view, actually, the virus, these viruses teach our immune system how to deal with infections because we, we learn from these viruses how to, uh, not to react so strongly. And the viruses like EBV actually establish a very fine balance with the immune system. These viruses don't want to kill us. They actually want to live with us. And we have, they, 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 only, they, only, they, they live with us till we die, basically, and they don't cause any major illness. And unless you have, our immune system goes into some sort of a dis, dysfunctional state, that's when these diseases emerge, whether it's MS or any of the lymphomas, it has underlying immune defect, which leads to these, these sort of complications. What is the history of EBV and MS? It's very interesting. I drew out this sort of looked at a lot of papers and found this sort of timeline history. It's as early as 1979, that very first story came out when there was a link was suggested between EBV and MS. And it's almost like, you know, 10 or 15 years before that was when the EBV was discovered by Tony Epstein in collaboration with Dennis Burkett, who used to work in Kenya, and he used to supply him some of the tissue samples from kids who had Burkitt lymphoma, and they could not find anything initially, but they later found that that's, that lymphoma had EBV in them, and that's how the whole thing progressed, and then subsequently a number of other studies appeared. When there was 1980, the high EBV antibodies were noticed, and of course the link between IM, which is an acute EBV infection in MS, was actually first time demonstrated in 2010, and I put our place in there because of the, we, we did the first T-cell therapy studies of that one. But I think the more important study was that uh, has come from the epidemiological sort of um, evidence, and I think Gavin mentioned that this study is done by Alberta Shirio, and this is a fascinating study in U.S. military personnel where they are, these military personnel are bled at regular interval as a part of normal monitoring, and what they noticed that when they actually went back and followed these, some of these um, military personnel, those people who developed MS and who did not, and actually all those people who did have a history of MS developing had a history of acute infectious mono in that some time of their life before they developed the uh, infectious mono. And very interestingly, exactly, this is showing the high risk of, if you have the risk of getting MS increases as your EBV antibody responses increases at as high as 36 volts, sort of the very high. As your antibody teachers, if they are greater than 320, you have a very high risk of developing MS in this, in this cohort. And the other interesting observation, I know there was some suggestion made in the morning that people haven't seen any B cells or lymphoid cells in the tissues. This was a very interesting study published in 2007 by an Italian group <laughs> where they actually showed very clearly that there are these so-called ectopic B-cell follicles in the meninges, and, and that was the one that started the whole discussion in where the, I mean, whether what the role these B-cells might be playing in this disease. And what was fascinating, within these, these so-called follicles, they could see EBV nuclear, or they call it EBV encoded RNAs in there, which is called EBER. But on top of that, these EBERs were actually correlating wherever the B-cells were there, 
there was the Eber expression in these, in these lesions. So you can see every single B cells, which is there in the follicles, also has what we call EBV encoded RNA there, clearly showing very strong correlation. But not only that, these B cells also express EBV antigens, number of other antigens. So it is an EBV nuclear antigen too, latent membrane one, and also other ones which are associated with the lytic cycle of the virus. They showed that very nicely in, in all those sort of situations. And more recently, Larry Steinman's group, where I'm also co-author in this paper, and they've shown very nice study. This is actually a, I, I like this because, not because I'm author on this, but they did a much better sort of a control study. In a sense, they had these topsy samples, but also took some controlled brain samples, and then took samples from the chronic active plaques and the chronic plaques. They could just see the expression of CD20, CD130 was a plasma cell, and LMP1 and BZLF1, uh, which is two of the EBV antigens. What was interesting was, Finding EBV was not that unusual. You, they could even see in the control brain samples also there was some EBV detected. But what was interesting was that the EBV was much higher, much frequently detected in MS patients than the LMP1 expression, which is the latent membrane protein of MNO1. But the opposite was the case with the BZLF1. Very few BZLF1 positive, that is a lytic cell, infected cells were seen in the, in the, in the MS. So I think there is a, it's a growing sort of an evidence from both from the Italian group and from the Larry Steinman's group that there is some an increased propensity to have EBV infection in the brain, and then it subsequently leads to some other downstream events that drives the whole inflammation due to the EBV infection or the EBV infected B cells reaching into the brain of the MS patients. Now, the obvious question is how does the EBV is control when we get this infection naturally in our body, and I think I, here I just want to acknowledge two of the pioneers in this field, which is Dennis Moss and Alan Rickinson. Dennis is actually a mentor, and Alan actually from Birmingham here in England. Uh, they were the two actually people who really established the whole concept of what we call T-cell control of EBV. And that was it's almost 40 years ago. This 1978, this paper was published by them in International of Cancer. It's a very interesting phenomenon. When you actually take peripheral blood uh, from any person of most of you and played it in, in an incubator or incubate in, in an incubator you know, and put the white blood cells. If you're being exposed to EBV previously, what will you notice that these cells, you'll see these clumps growing. They're actually nothing else but EBV transformed B cells. Their immortalized cell line starts growing out. And if you're actually being previously exposed to EBV, initially these cells will expand, then these cells will die. But if you had not been exposed to EBV previously and you add exogenously the virus on the cells, these cells will grow and continue to grow and they will never die. And there was a simple principle in there. In this case, the patients who are donors who are seropositive or they have been exposed, they have existing immunity. So initially the cells grow, but then this T cell immunity comes in and kills those outgrowing B cells, EBV infected. And they term this concept called regression. Very nicely word, when back in 1970, they, they, the word that was used regression in for this. And whereas the seronegative people cannot regress these outgrowing of the B cells because they don't have any T cell immunity, basically. So that's a whole concept. And this simple principle has now become a basis of T cell therapy for all EBV associated diseases. Such a beautiful experiment, a simple in a plastic dish that somebody's doing, and it turns out to be a, a way to treat patients. The other fascinating thing which Michael has published, a series of papers, I've taken one figure from his one of these papers published in 2014, that if you measure the T cell immunity or the type of the T cells that control the EBV infection in healthy individuals like you and I, you not generally notice as you grow older, you tend to maintain that immunity quite well. This is how the dotted line goes. But in MS patients, he noticed that actually the, the EBV specific T cell immunity as you grow older it declines, and, and, and particularly the EBV-specific T cell immunity declines in the MS patients particularly. And what is interesting that very recently, actually last month, this paper has again, another paper has come from the Italian group who originally showed the EBV, that they showed in the same lesions, you can actually have EBV-specific T cells migrating into the brain, and these T cells are actually recognizing in EBV-infected B cells. The markers you're seeing is, is actually the T cell markers on those, on those cells which are actually inside the brain lesions clearly showing you the, the migration of those B cells into the lesions can also drive or attracts the EBV specific T cells to come into the site and then trigger the downstream sort of a, all the inflammatory process. Now, what is the underlying mechanism that could be possibly playing the role 
in, in contributing the, through EBV mediated sort of a, um, MS pathogenesis. This is one of the theory which has been proposed by Christian Mung and a few other people support this, is actually what happens when the EBV infects the primary B cells, and these B cells start making antibodies, and these antibodies actually are specific to myelin protein, and then they cross the blood-brain barrier, and they go in and damage the... Hello? Is the voice gone? Yeah, sorry. It's, um, so did that actually lead to the... But I think I, I'm, I'm just sort of a plus-minus on this theory. I just haven't seen any clear evidence to support it, but I think most realistic evidence is this one, where possibly what happens, the... In an acute stage of infection, when you get a primary infection, the EBV infects the B cells. As you're coming in, then it infects the B cells. That leads to the very strong T cell response. But what happens, some of those B cells, which are also autoreactive, gets infected at that stage and escape this immune control. And those are the B cells which are not only stay in your uh, blood circulation, they also reach into the CNS, in the central nervous system. And that's where they start attracting all those additional T cells and other contributing cells, but they also make autoantibodies as well. Uh, and that's how they lead to this downstream pathogenesis, the MS. Look, it's only speculative, but this is how the model sits at, as it we speak now. So, but the evidence for the exact role of EBV, uh, sorry, the, the B cells in the pathogenesis MS, I think to some extent gets sort of supported by two multiple studies where they have used B cell depleting antibodies for treatment of the MS patient. And clearly showing if you give the rituximab, and I think this was discussed early in the morning as well, not only reduces the existing lesion, but also prevents the formation of new lesions as well. And this was a study published in 2008. And more recently, the acrylizumab is also supporting the same evidence that you can actually have a significant reduction in the lesions when you treat the patients with acrylizumab. This was a, a recent study again, 2007. And plus, they have a patients have the confirmed disability progression is significantly reduced if you give them anti-B cell antibodies. Now, the argument from our side has been that why to deplete all the B cells? Why not use a very specific targeted therapy, in this case the T cell therapy, to remove those B cells which have EBV, which might be driving the pathogenesis of EBV, uh, the MS? And to test this hypothesis, we've been sort of started this whole immunotherapy program. And, it, and we decided to think about how we would design the T cell therapy. And what we did was rather than taking the whole virus as a targeting strategy, we actually focused our T cell therapy program to three EBV encoded antigens, which is called EBV nuclear antigen one, LMP1, LMP2. And why did we do that? Was that because these are three proteins of EBV which had consistently been observed to be detectable in MS lesions, or MS lesions with B cells in there. And what we then did, we actually designed a viral vector, which is actually an adenoviral vector, which is a replication deficient adenoviral vector. The other thing which is, before I explain that, these particular proteins are, are very interesting. They are actually, uh, in fact, they can cause uh, transformation of the cells independent of any other cofactors. So you have to be careful how you design the immunotherapy. So we had to actually take specific the fragments of the virus, which were critical for immune control, and design what we call a polyepitope, and link the EBNA1 protein in front of that and insert it into this viral vector. And that actually vector was used for manufacturing of our T cell therapy, it specifically target the T cell against LMP1, LMP2, which is latent membrane proteins, and the ABV nuclear antigen. And it, the whole of this program actually started with very one fish patient, which Michael came to me in 2013. And this particular patient was a 42-year-old patient who had a first attack of MS in 1994, and, a, and, a, and relapsing and remitting disease in 2004, and, but it subsequently he progressed to, you know, to develop a secondary progressive disease patient. And they had a multiple complications. You, know, you can see here he had you know, bleeding, degenerative ulcer, many other complications as well. By 2012, the patient was working full time at home as a manager and an EDSS score of 8.0. He had a you know, severe CDA T cell deficiency, particularly the EBV specific deficiency. And that's when Michael approached me and said, Look, Raj, we would like to treat this patient with EBV T cells. I've been pushing this concept. And, uh, why wouldn't we try that? And to be honest, I, I just got off my chair, I said, forget about it, Michael, we're just not gonna do that because uh, treating an autoimmune disease patient when the dogma is that the T cells are driving the disease, how would you put the T cells back into the patient? You will actually make the patient even more sicker. Uh, but somehow, I think Michael and I sat down and thought, how would we deal with this? And I'll go through that, what we did to, to overcome that potential threat in our mind. 
And we designed this strategy of expanding the T cells from the MS patient using this process. The first thing we did was we take the blood sample from the patient, we bring it into our uh, GMP facility, which is the manufacturing facility. We expose a proportion of their white blood cells to this adenoviral vector, and then they are mixed back with the remaining blood cells, and the, these cells are cultured for almost 14 days, 14 to 20 days. And these cells then expand these EBB uh, specific T cells, and these cells go through very stringent testing. The stringent testing not just includes that they are sterile and clean, but also potential self-reactivity, what we call is the alloreactivity or self-reactivity. We make sure that the only EBB specific T cells are there. But on top of that, we did a very careful dosing strategy that what we will do is we'll treat the patient with what almost like a quarter of the cells that we normally would give to a cancer patient. So we reduced the dose right down to five million cells. Then we waited for the patient to to look at whether the patient was not having any adverse reaction. Then we increased to 10 million, 15 million, then to 20 million. I can tell you the very first day when the first infusion, I didn't, did not sleep on that night. <laughs> the patient is going to be telling us what the hell you're doing to my. So then we followed the patient on the week 7, 9, 11, 13. And then every single time we were waiting for the patient to tell us that there is some problem. But to our surprise, the, the patient did not show any adverse event at all. In fact, not even um, flu-like symptoms or any malaise or anything. The, the whole therapy went on reasonably well. To our surprise, um, patients started showing some clinical improvements, which is encouraging improvements. I won't say improvement. Um, you know, it could be, you can call it as a subjective, you know, objective improvements, but it, we noticed that patients started showing reduction in fatigue, painful lower limbs, and spasms and improvement in cognition and hand function, increasing productivity of the face. But I think what the more interesting thing was that by, he started showing voluntary movement of the lower limbs as well. And to some extent, um, I think what convinced me was, was this clinical you know, uh, evidence there. There was a dramatic reduction in gadolinium enhancing MRI lesions in this patient. These are the four arrows showing the infusion time points. And also the intrathecal IgG dropped as well in this patient. And there were three lesions here shown here, which also sort of disappeared post T-cell therapy. And what was coincident with that was that the, the, there was slight improvement, not a huge improvement, but there was slight improvement rather than going down if the patient showed improvement in the EBV-specific T-cell immunity in the, in the blood. So that was sort of a relief and sort of a, a positive sign. There was something happening in this patient. We didn't know whether this was real or not. And that actually led to a, um, a proper formal clinical study. Uh, we established a clinical trial after a long discussion with the ethics committee. And in this study, we actually recruited 13 patients. Uh, of those, three were withdrawn due to either non-availability of the T cells or one of the patients actually developed malignancies before even getting the T cell infusion. So we were left with 10 patients, five primary progressors, five secondary progressors. And each of these patients were given exactly the same dose that we had given to the first patient. And then they were followed up to 27 weeks. Um, and, and each of the patients went through extensive clinical examination, um, including neurological and the EDSS score, fatigue, cognition, depression, all sorts of measurements were done in these patients. And here is a sort of a, I'm sorry, it's a complicated immunology, not very simple one, basically showing you that if you use that methodology, we could actually consistently make the T-cell uh, product or a drug product from these, each of the patients. But there were some patients who were much less efficient in giving us the T-cell product, but quite a large number of patients gave us a good T-cell product. I'll come back to that because it shows a beautiful correlation of the clinical response and what we actually, the drug product quality is. What was interesting, so the first thing we looked at was the fatigue severity, and there was a clearly, um, from week one to week 27, there was a significant reduction, but what was more interesting was, these are the, uh, out of the 10 patients, sorry, that seven patients showed a clear evidence of improvement in the fatigue, and you can see those patients each being monitored for subsequently post T-cell therapy, and the green, the red ones, did not show any improvement in the fatigue score. The other thing was, sorry, it's a very busy slide. The reason I want to show you this, please try and try to, I'll, I'll get you an example. The patient two, patient six, and patient eight were considered to be the non-responders, whereas the patient one, three, four, five, um, uh, nine, and 12, and 13 were responders. Now, if you just go through that, what I want to highlight, I'm not a clinician in my training, I'm, a, I'm an immunologist. Uh, what I find fascinating is that every patient has a different type of 
response to the T cell therapy. And although fatigue is a common phenomenon, the improvement in the fatigue, but some of these patients have very interesting things happen to them. I don't know whether they're real or not. I'm just making a, showing you what actually happened. For example, one of the patients had improvement in the color vision. Another patient had, had not been, she says that reduction in, uh, increased the manual dexterity in utensils. Where was oh, Sorry, one, somebody had a yes. She said, insertion of earrings for the first time in ears improved walking up to 100 to 100, 1,500 meters with wheelchair. So just an improvement in mobility. In each of these patients, we were able to see significant changes in their clinical features, which was quite interesting to observe in these patients. The number of patients we noticed, the EDSS score went down to 5 to 4.0, 4.5, 3.5. But in, in some patients, in, for example, number eight, who was a non-responder, initially showed some improvement in the mental clarity, but then the EDSS score went up. Of course, this is a phase one study. It's not a controlled study. We, we need to do a lot more work on this. But what it actually gave us a hint that there is something the C cells do in, in these patients, that actually they are improving the immunity of these patients or they're controlling the EBV infection, which is leading to some of these um, subjective clinical responses. And what was interesting that this is the very first patient that we treated as an individual patient outside the trial. Because we had already been into the trial, and we noticed that previously in 2012 or 2013, when we initially treated this patient, he had a drop in the CSF IgG. The patient started to get worse, um, and his clinical symptom returned again. And he requested that he would like to get another dose of T cells. And so we actually, rather than offering him as on a compassionate ground, we asked our ethics committee, could we enroll him back into the trial? And we did that, and we was given another four infusions in 2017. And you can see that as soon as we infused his IgG in the CSF, and also in the CSF IgG in the milligram dropped again, giving us a hint or evidence that potentially that the, you know, the initial drop and the subsequent drop probably was in sense maybe partly contributed by the, the T cell infusions that we had given to the patients. Of course, we need to do a lot more patients like these to really see repeat dosaging. What does it actually improve there and there? What was interesting was then to find why some patients respond, why others don't respond. I, it's, it's not an easy question to answer. But what we did notice, one thing, that if you, I don't want to confuse the immunology part of it too much, but if you look at the, the patients who actually do respond, so-called they had a blue color cells. And the blue color cells are highlighted by that they had a very strong EBV specific reactivity. The yellow color cells are the ones which are weak T cell reactive. If you actually have yellow color T cells given to you, you do not respond very well. Whereas if you had a lot more blue color T cells, you get much better response. And what's the other thing is that these cells make certain what we call cytokines, uh, which are, they have an antiviral role. And some of these typical functions are interferon gamma, IL-2, TNF. And if you see the patients who do respond had a much higher what we call polyfunctionality compared to the ones who did not respond. It's clearly showing the drug product quality that we're manufacturing in the laboratory has a very significant impact on the clinical responses of these patients. We, we went step one forward again, and in this case, we actually did a, what we call a deep sequencing of the T cells. And in this case, what we do is we actually sequence the T cell receptor. What is a T cell receptor? It actually the receptor which the T cells express to latch on to the, to the MHC molecule on the virus-infected cells. You can use the sequencing to read what is the CDR3 sequence on those T cells, so that can tell you what are the actual reads on there that will tell you whether the T cell is right specificity or not. And you can do that by deep sequencing. And what we did was we took the T cell products that we had given to these patients and did extensive deep sequencing analysis. And what we noticed that the patients who were the responders, which is on the top here, the 39, 3, 12, and 5. And then those who are non-responders, you can see that again, they are predominantly have larger proportion of what we call blue cells, whereas the one with non-responders has a much bigger proportion of yellow cells, which is actually they're non-reactive to EBV cells. Even if we manufactured for EBV, but they did not expand those EBV specific, much lower proportion of cells. Clearly showing you that having a higher proportion of EBV specific T cells in the product can correlate with the clinical response to these patients. But there's a challenge on this. This is actually a, uh, one of the things we noticed that in number of patients, the quality of the T-cell products or we could not manufacture. The autologous T-cell therapies would always be a big issue because it takes much longer to produce 
But also, there's some of the patients, because being receiving a lot of other drugs, would have a very poor immunity and be very difficult to expand T cells. So we actually been sort of thinking how to overcome these sort of limitations. And we need to develop a methodology or a rapid access system. So that's where we established this collaboration with Atara Biotherapeutics. And what we're now doing is that we're actually now manufacturing an off-the-shelf T cell uh, therapy. And in this case, what we do is we take peripheral blood from healthy donors like you and I, and then these peripheral blood samples are then actually taken the mononuclear cells. They are sensitized with that same viral vector. We expand the EBV-specific T cells and then make multiple doses of these, these cells and store it down in, in a bank. And then the MS patients are matched by tissue typing, and if they're matched by one or two HLA leads, we offer the T cell therapy to those patients. Hope it makes sense. So basically, they are not autologous T cells. These are allogeneic, off-the-shelf T cell therapy offered to the patient. There are two or three major advantages. One is that you are driving the T cells from healthy donors. They are not sick patients. Number two, they are rapidly available. They can be stored in large quantities. So in a single batch of T cell manufacturing, we can actually manufacture up to hundreds or thousands of vials in a single hit. So that becomes the feasibility of delivery, not just in your local hospital, but right across the you know, country or in, across the net, multiple countries, you can supply that. The whole supply chain becomes a different, it becomes like a off-the-shelf drug, drug therapy. And it's not that we have something that we have done new just for this MS only. The, you know, Atara has been successful in using the same concept to treat lymphoma patients, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease patients. And what has been fascinating, the clinical responses has been remarkable with as high as 60% clinical responses with no infusion-related toxicity, no CRS, which is cytokine release syndrome, and very few graft-versus-host disease, which is a major risk potentially of using an allogeneic T cells from an unrelated donor to putting into a patient. You have a risk those T cells would cause graft-versus-host disease. Remarkably, in this setting, there has been no evidence of any evidence of GVHD or very limited evidence of GVHD. So taking clue from that study and also having be, being developed the whole process, Atara actually recently launched a phase one open label study where they actually pretty much repeated the study that we've done in autologous setting, but gone, went one step forward. They've actually just initiated, they took a, um, four different cohorts of patients where they've given cohort once, each of the cohort has six patients and they got 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, and 40 million. This was a one up the dose that we had gone up. So from 20 million, now they've added in the 40 million. And each of the patients in this, each cohort were dosed at, at, at three infusions in cycle one and wait for one month and then another doses of three weekly cycles of T cell therapy, then monitored for various clinical features including all these clinical uh, assessments and also the outcome criteria uh, without going in great detail. So the patients are still being followed. It's in the early stage of you know, the, the clinical study. But what has been very nice to see that there is no dose-limiting toxicity in the allogeneic T cells, which is very interesting. And only grade one or grade two, in, in majority of the patient, only one patient uh, had shown a grade three uh, treatment-related sort of uh, um, um, safety profile. One patient in cohort four, which is the last one, showed a grade three uh, A um, and, and a dosing setting the URI symptoms as possible dental infection. I, I, I don't think it's related to T cell, but we cannot rule that out. And you can see most of the patients have done reasonably when cohort. All these patients have been now infused, and very little, if any, of the you know treatment-related side effects. What has been Quite interesting, uh, very early readout is suggesting that although in cohort one, um, there is not much uh, evidence of improvement. There was only one patient, but in cohort two, which has received 10 million cells, um, <clears throat> there has been partial clinical improvement um, and, and then the clinical improvement two patients and almost over six out of six patients are showing, showing some evidence of clinical improvement. And in the 12 month period, these are the cohort one um, was showing minimal changes. So it's clearly showing you that the autologous or the off-the-shelf T cell therapy is safe to give into the MS patients, and maybe, maybe uh, the long-term follow-up will show us that it can actually uh, show us some improvement in the clinical responses. Just to wrap up uh, my talk, I it clearly showed you that it looks like the EBV is essential for MS, may not be sufficient because it needs other cofactors. The patient MMS have CDA T cell deficiency, 
And it can be determined by genetically because of the HLA association or other thing. But I think more interesting thing is what I want to conclude is that the early studies are showing that adoptive T cell therapy, whether autologous or off the shelf, probably has a good hope for showing some clinical responses in these patients and opens a new opportunity for, for, for many of the MS patients. Just quickly to conclude, um, I would like to thank my team um, in, our, in my lab. A lot of people have contributed to this, particularly Michael's team, uh, some of the uh, nursing staff and the other team in his group who have done a huge amount of work in during monitoring the patients in, the, in our 1565 studies and our cell therapy facility, which is really remarkable. Thank you.